Now let's see with part 14 of the respondent. Starts off with the, uh, the just war theory. I don't know anything about this. I'm just going to take his word for it. Apparently it has to do with actual wars, like real wars, and when they're supposed to be conducted and specific rules and principles that are um, supposed to be applied. Anyway, he goes through this list of principles. The first one is that family court promotes pre preemptive attacks for strikes, which I guess is inconsistent with that and it's not moral. The next one is that it urges um, ambush. Um, the next one is that it favors the ruthless. And the next one is that it rewards the unethical. I'll go through these one by one. I, I'm pretty sure that he's right on all of them. So first strikes, uh, yeah, it does. It does promote that, especially when it comes to the jurisdiction that you want to file and if you want to relocate. I know for sure there are attorneys who tell their client, hey, you haven't filed anything yet, there's no case open, move, just move first and then let him figure out what to do. And if he files, he can try and bring you back. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but he'll be on a back foot the whole time. And I'm just using the he, she, you know, the typical most, you know, most common occurrence. I don't know if nowadays that's the case, but it certainly was before. Um, then we have the um, ruthless. Yes, that's true, because when you when you're dealing with kids, and child custody, you're dealing with innocence and they need to be taken care of. And the parent that's ruthless doesn't care about the kids, or at least they they justify their conduct and blame the other side for... So when they do something that hurts the kids, they say, well, I'm only doing that because the other person made me because they're not giving me what I want, stuff like that. So yes, it definitely uh, favors the ruthless and rewards the unethical. I think in the sense of attorneys, definitely yes. I don't think that this is like a policy. I think it's just a sort of side effect with how the system, I don't even want to say design, because it makes it seem like it was designed to reward the unethical. I think that it's it's more of a coincidence and a recognition of sort of the situation as it is, just given the fact that attorneys have most of the influence in family court. There's just, I mean, the only other person that participates is families, and ordinary families really don't have any pull they don't have any political power. Um, they didn't go to school with the judges. They aren't friends with the judges. They don't go to lunch with the judges. They don't, like all that stuff go, I mean, even election wise and uh, reputation wise, like they, they talk about each other favorably, disfavorably. I mean, if a judge makes a parent mad, oh well, the parent moves on, they don't have any power. But if a judge makes the attorney mad, sometimes the attorney can do something about it. And especially if they band together and they can also appeal. I mean, parents can appeal too, but often it's, an issue of money but when it comes to like if you sanction a lawyer those go up i've seen those go up on uh, what they call writ review and i mean even if you don't even if you don't impose like a single dollar i've seen what they call reputational sanctions get overturned so you just have a situation where the parents aren't able to fight back as much as the lawyers can and i think that there's just sort of this sort of this subconscious awareness of this problem and that makes it so that I don't want to know if I want to say unethical conduct is rewarded so much as it's just not really policed as much as it probably could be. So, I mean, I feel like if a judge was to really crack down on abusive litigation practices and unethical attorney conduct, then they would just get challenged all the time. They'd get taken up to the Supreme Court three times a week and, you know, maybe they'll win some, but they'll also lose some. And maybe they just don't want to deal with that. Maybe they just want to preside over their cases and move on. I mean, it's a court system that is used to very little oversight. Criminal judges I've talked about, they get appealed all the time. They're used to it. There's just no avoiding it. And then you got the civil non-family. They have a lot of um, litigants that are rich, giant companies, banks, HOAs, stuff like that. They can fight back. They have money. But when you deal with family court, you just have parents. Some of them are rich. Some of them can fight back. Most of them can't. And so, for the most part, the judges just are not under the same scrutiny. By the way, even if the richer parents can fight back, um, there is so much discretion in the area of family law that oftentimes there's nothing you can do about it anyway. So there's just a lot, there's a lot of policy, the way that the rules are fashioned, the way that the statutes were made, that just coincidentally has resulted in the situation where unethical conduct isn't really policed that much because it just... It's not practical for a judge to do it, and in some cases, it can really damage the judge's reputation. You know, it, like I said, it just comes down to lawyers are more able to fight back than their clients are. They just are. 
It's just the reality of the situation. Um, unwilling participant in what he calls the uncivil war that he did not start. Okay, this is when he gets into the no-fault fallacy. I talked about this in the last video. Yes, he goes full-blown, repeal no-fault. Like, it's so bad. I don't know how a I don't know how a person can advocate this without coming off as controlling, as a control freak. If your partner does not want to be in a relationship with you, why on earth would you want them to, to force them to stay with you? It is so... In my opinion, it actually destroys the whole book. It, it, it takes away... In my opinion, it, it makes him completely invalid, all of the arguments that he's making. To hear him advocate for the end of, of no fault as a solution to the problem, it's crazy because the conflict will still be there. It'll just be stuck in the marriage. Instead of the abuse happening through the court system, the abuse will happen in the home. It's, it's so obviously wrong. <sighs> He, he has a few other arguments about how no fault isn't actually no fault because they bring up fault in the divorce all the time anyway. But that's a nonsense argument because just because there's no fault in the separation doesn't mean that there isn't going to be fault issues in marital waste or in um, the custody. The, the, the kids could be abused or neglected. Like These are valid arguments. Just because people lie doesn't mean suddenly you just have to take away the, the remedy completely. It's just, it's like going from one extreme to the other is what he's advocating. Um, he says that no fault divorce renders marriage as an illusion. Seriously? So keeping people together in a marriage that isn't a real marriage is still an illusion. If they both hate each other or if one person is abusing the other one into oblivion, how is that not an illusion of a marriage also? It's, it's just because you can't file paperwork to separate doesn't mean that the marriage is any more real. It's not. It's is it's this is the most disappointing chapter I've seen from this author. Um, he says that in other areas of contract law, you have to compensate the person who breaches the contract. Okay, so now marriage is transactional. It's a transaction to him. It's it's I give you this, you give me that. If you don't give me that, then I want what I gave you back. It's it's like it's it's not even doubling down it's like tripling down um he brings up the fifth and 14th amendments of the constitution to say that there's no due process in family court that's not true as far as i've seen in nevada you can file motions you can file oppositions you can file replies you can file complaints you can file all these things that's fine that's the due process there if a judge does something specifically that breaks the rules you can file an appeal people file appeals all the time and get you know the decisions overturned for uh, due process violations it happens so i mean the system was not designed to violate those constitutional amendments it just so happens that sometimes a judge will make a mistake that violates due process that violates those constitutional amendments and you can get that overturned on appeal and it gets overturned it's uh, it's not fair in the sense that a lot of people don't have access to the supreme court but if you're going to say that that violates due process then you basically are saying that due process is violated everywhere that that people don't have a free lawyer i mean it's a it's an it's really messed up and it's unfair it's absolutely true that it's messed up and it's unfair but it's not unconstitutional um he talks about how 50 50 custody is more common with same-sex couples i don't think so because i don't think it has anything to do with the gender at all i think that the problem is the parent who carried the child is is the one that expects to be favored um and that's you're gonna still see that with same-sex couples if it's if one of the you know the partners in the couple carry the child in fact there's at least one example i can think of where that's come up and that's the our nevada judge's coverage of the state of nevada versus julie hammer so i mean it's not so much a gender thing as it's a, you know whoever carried the child gets special powers or special privileges or special rights that the other person doesn't get and that's i think that that's where that's where that's rooted so obviously it's going to come up in heterosexual relationships because those are just conventional you know, the mom had the baby and the dad didn't. But it can come up in same-sex um, relationships as well. And in some of those situations, one of the parents carry the child. You know, so that's, that's just what's going to happen. Um, let's see. He says, child support system. Okay, this is the one of the more frustrating ones. I already talked about this in a few other videos. So I'm not going to talk about it a whole lot more. He says that the child support system 
is a source of a lot of the rage, which I do happen to agree with. All of the portions of the family court system that touch on money, those are the raw sort of infuriating um, portions of family court. And so whether you're dealing with alimony or attorney fees, or in this case, child support, that is true that that's where most of the rage is. Absolutely. But um, he says that child support grew out of Title 4D and that the solution to all of this is to eliminate Title 4D because there's these financial incentives for the counties to go after parents for child support. He, I feel like he's got it completely backwards. Um, I don't think child support was created by Title 4D at all. I think that the welfare, the problem of welfare created child support and that the problem of child support collection created Title 4D. So it's, it's really, in my opinion, it's the third layer. There's two layers underneath it. Um, you can't get rid of Title 4D unless you get rid of child support, or at least make it so that child support is so nominal that people don't feel like they need help collecting it. Like, it just isn't a crisis for them to not have their child support money. And you can't get rid of that. You can't get rid of child support unless you deal with the problem of welfare. And what I mean by that is the government is not cool with parents popping out a bunch of kids, five, six, seven, eight kids, and not paying for them. And then they end up on SNAP or on um, TANF. I mean, they're not going to say this like on a commercial, like, how dare you have kids that we have to support? Obviously, they're not going to say that. The government's like, the governor's not going to step out on behind a camera and say, you know, bad parents, stop having kids. They're not going to say anything like that. But they kind of communicate their discontent or their disapproval through their policies. They really do. And basically, if a parent has a kid that would be on TANF or on SNAP benefits, food stamps, and then they get child support from the dad, and now they're making enough money that they're not getting as many benefits, or maybe they're not getting any benefits at all because now they're getting the financial support. Well, the government obviously likes that situation. That's somebody who's not being supported by the taxpayer. Obviously, that's good for the government. If you have the other situation where they don't have any child support policy, and all these people are having kids, and then they all end up on, on food stamps and stuff like that, that's something that's concerning. And, and like I said, they're not going to say this because it sounds bad. You just make people angry. They'll be like, you can't control how many kids I have. You'll have an angry mob. And so they don't talk about it. They just stay nice and quiet. And then they, they, they create these policies to find ways to to support these extra kids on, on, the, on the backs of anyone but the government. And so, I mean, people mostly accept it. I mean, they figure, hey, if you had a kid, you should have to pay for your kid. It's pretty reasonable. But I'm saying beyond just the logic and the reasonableness of paying for your own kid, there's the problem of welfare. I mean, that's that's underneath all of it. So you've got all these child support orders that come out. Well, a lot of parents aren't going to know how to seize it. If you, if you take away Title 4D and you take away the child support divisions and you just leave parents on their own to fend for themselves, to file writs of execution and debtor's exams, first of all, it's going to exacerbate the conflict because now the parent has to execute on the, the money that they're owed which I've had to do before, and it does exacerbate the conflict. And then you have the situation where just a lot of parents just aren't going to know how to do it, or they're going to be too busy or too distracted, or they're not going to have time. They're going to be stressed out. They're going to be going to work. They're not going to want to put all these hours into chasing the other parent around and seizing their money. And so you're just going to have all these uncollected child support you know, dollars. I have a strong suspicion. I wasn't paying enough attention maybe when I was younger, or maybe it was before my time. I have a strong uh, suspicion that this was a hugely political issue probably when before I was born or maybe when I was two, three years old or something. And politicians probably said something like, hey, we can get your child support money. You guys are owed a bunch of child support money. You can't take care of your kids. You should be able to take care of your kids. So guess what? We're going to just go ahead and get it for you. And so you have a situation where Title 4D, in my opinion, is is supported by the population. By It's a popular thing that's got popular support because people would rather somebody else go and get the money for them so they don't have to do it. It's less work for them. If you have a dis if you can spend 10 hours learning how to execute, you know, and seize money from a bank account, or the government can just do it for you, you're going to choose option B because then you can spend your time doing other stuff. So that's the situation is if I feel like if these people attacking Title 4D ever got any sort of traction and it became a serious issue and it actually was close to happening, then you would have this this mob come up and say, "Hey, we don't want to go get our own child support. So I think a lot of people think that if you eliminate Title 4D, you eliminate child support, but it's just not the, it's not the case. If you eliminate Title 4D, you still have child support. You just have people having to collect the judgments on their own rather than the government doing it for them. 
So yeah, it's true. There's a financial incentive. They get commissions for every dollar they collect. All that stuff's true. And that's just the government, I guess the federal government, trying to find a way to incentivize the state governments going out and collecting the child support for the parents and handing it over to the parents. And that's just, in my opinion, it's not something that is like a secret insidious governmental apparatus. It also, in my opinion, has a ton of popular support because all these parents who are getting money from the district attorney's office without Title IV-D, now they would have to go get the money on their own. And they're just not going to want to do that. They're just not going to want to. So yeah, you can't deal with Title IV-D unless you deal with child support. You can't deal with child support unless you deal with the problem of welfare. It's just, it's so deeply entrenched. The, the problem of kids being able to be supported by their parents rather than the government, it's just not going to go away. It's, it's a huge issue. It's not, oh, this isn't needed. People can just pay for their own kids and they don't need money. I mean, joint physical custody is the road to that sort of scenario because then you have the financial obligations being offset. It could get, I mean, if enough parents have joint custody, it could really get um, the child support situation under control. It's possible. But I don't think that the elimination of Title IV-D is the answer. I think that the continued push for joint physical custody is the answer. Because if you keep doing that, you're going to have both genders paying for child support instead of just one gender. And you're going to have mitigated child support, which is great. Because instead of one person paying 600 both people have custody. And maybe one person pays 50 bucks, 100 bucks. That's going to lead you closer to the elimination of Title IV-D and the mitigation of child support as an issue. Then, then let's just get rid of this law. It's this obsession with this one law and they continue to attack this law and they don't, they just don't, it, to me, it doesn't sound like they have any understanding of what the point of Title IV-D is. And they just focus on the fact that, hey, look, you get money for collecting, so it's evil because now they're going to, yeah, that's fine. But the parents who are receiving the checks don't see it that way. They're like, hey, I get 800 bucks a month and I don't have to do anything. They go and get it for me. They see it as a service. They see it as convenient. They want that. Um, so let's see, joint custody legislation, uh, maximize. Okay. Yeah. That's what I was talking about earlier is, is yeah, there's a lot of joint custody legislation out there now. Um, and it's spreading across the country and it's good. He also talks about um, confusing terms in the legislature, like, uh, maximize parenting time. I forgot where that one came from. I think it was from Arizona, but uh, he does mention Nevada's preference to uh, physical custody, which is actually, it is actually a point of contention. It's been brought up before on some of the R Nevada judges panels that, uh, that this word isn't defined and so nobody knows what to do with it. It's a problem, he's right. Um, he talks about domestic violence and how it should be proved in criminal court. This is not, I get his frustration. And keep in mind guys, if you look at the My Docket series, you'll see that I went through this nonsense too. So I mean, I would have benefited from something like this where domestic violence has to be proved in criminal court or it's just not a thing, period. I understand where that's coming from. I get the frustration. I have been lied about with regards to DV. It's, I totally feel it. The problem is the state isn't going to prosecute every case. There are lots of cases that have enough proof, but the state's busy and it's gonna depend on jurisdiction. So like if you're in a rural district, they may prosecute a whole bunch of people because they have the resources and they don't have that many people that are committing crimes. But if you're in like Vegas or if you're in like Reno, you may have a situation where you just have a gigantic metropolis. There's too many people that live there and the DA just can only go after the worst of the worst cases. So if the DA is only able to go after the worst of the worst cases, does that mean that all of the other cases that the DA didn't go after didn't have domestic violence? No, they just didn't have enough resources to prosecute all the other ones. You have a lot of situations where people can take a go to court, a civil court, and they can't go or they don't have to wait for a criminal court to do something. Like if you, I think the OJ, uh, OJ Simpson case, the uh, the criminal stuff was not guilty, but they sued in civil court. So if you follow this logic, this you have to, you know, you can't charge somebody with a crime in civil court. If you follow that logic, that actually would pervade all of the other all other areas of the law and civil liability. There's all kinds of civil liability that's criminal. Um, also, and you, you're, he, I feel like he's frustrated. He feels like he was cheated. And so then he has to change this rule to just make it impossible for it to happen again. A lot of people go that route and it's not good. It's bad from a policy standpoint. Um, by the way, the clear and convincing evidence standard is applied in Nevada. So, I mean, that's a great step in the right direction towards making it more difficult to prove criminal uh, domestic violence without a uh, prosecution. And I, that's probably something that they could do in other areas of uh, family court as well in other areas of any kind of law, 
we have allegations of some kind of criminal conduct, but they're being raised in civil court, not in criminal court. Yeah, clear and convincing evidence standards there. Uh, they can you know expand how that works. Educating judges. Nope. I mean, okay, sure they can be educated from from their own sort of system, but the litigant can't do it. It's just not going to happen. The litigant can't educate their judge. The judge is just not going to listen to you. Um, and honestly, I don't, you can only take that so far. You just, in my opinion, what you really want to get educated is the legislature. And you want them to enact policies that control what the judiciary can do consistent with that education. Yeah, there's going to be some areas where the judges are just going to always have discretion. And they would benefit tremendously from having some education um, but this isn't really a, the silver bullet. This isn't really, in my opinion, going to solve the problem. Some judges just aren't going to care to learn. They're not going to. They're not going to. They're going to reject the education. And really, what it's going to come down to is controlling the court through appeals, which, in its own sense, is not a perfect situation either. I I know a lot of people focus on this. They think that this is the solution to everything. It's just, in my opinion, it's one of those things that sounds good and it's been in practice and it's just not working. This is not. So I really feel like if they have to decide where to put the education, I wish that they would put the education towards the legislature and the policymakers, and I wish that they would enact statutes and rules consistent with the education and not just leave these wide, gaping wide windows of discretion all over the place and expect that the judges are going to educate themselves and figure out how to exercise their discretion correctly. Uh, it's just my opinion. Um, supervised visits. He talks a little bit about how there are people who are conducting supervised visits that are not trained and have no license. I mean, I don't see why that's a bad thing. Supervised visitation. From his perspective, he's concerned that they're going to become a witness, which is true, and it's not good. I hate that. There are situations where supervised visits are used, not because it's actually needed, but because one of the parents wants to use a supervisor as a witness in court, which is not... I mean, it's like a... It's just... It's, it's gaming the system. It's adding to the conflict, in my opinion. But there are other supervised um, supervisors that just need training for their own safety. In my opinion, it, it's not that they need training to be a good witness. In fact, that's please get away from that. It's more that they need training to be safe because these supervised visitation cases are dangerous cases sometimes. And I'm concerned that the, the, the supervisor doesn't have enough training and they could get hurt. They could intervene when they shouldn't. And so for me, it's it's a safety thing, um, not a witness thing. If, if the supervisor is being used as a witness, uh, just right off the bat, that just is not, it's, not, it's just not good. It's not fair. Like, come on. I mean, if, if the, and they can only be a witness to the person who's being targeted by the supervision. It's just, it's such a one-sided way to use supervised visitation. It's already bad enough that the parent can't see the child without somebody watching, but now, that person's gonna, gonna become a witness to be used against them in a courtroom. It's not good. Um, so he talks about rules and that there aren't any rules. There are plenty of rules, they're just not followed. And the reason why is because there's not enough appellate oversight. So like I was saying earlier in the video, criminal law appeals are filed all the time and the rules are followed very closely because the judges know they're gonna go up on appeal. Civil law, it's the same, even though it, there's not as many um, appeals that are filed in the sort of uh, volume sense, you still have very high dollar amounts at stake in these cases, very intelligent lawyers who are litigating these cases, and they file appeals and oftentimes win. Um, remarkably, the uh, non-family civil, you know, appellate percentage overturn rate is pretty high. And it just goes to show you that those lawyers are experts in what they're doing. And the rules are applied very carefully there because it's going to overturn. My opinion is family court there's hardly any appellate oversight compared to, you know, compared to criminal and non-family civil. And because of that, the rules have kind of just become guidelines. I mean, it's like, if you have a list of rules that you're only going to get checked up on once per year, why are you going to follow it? I mean, one, you might get overturned one time, two times, because just nobody's, nobody's going to your boss. Nobody's saying, hey, such and such isn't following the rules. You might do a thousand cases and like two people, two or three people go to your boss. It's just hard for the, the rules to be taken seriously if nobody's actually calling them out. 
That's why I think that the rules aren't followed very often. I think they, if there were as many appeals in family court as there were in those other types of cases, you would see people following the rules. That's what I think would happen. All right, guys, I think that's all I've got for you. If you have any questions, feel free to post them down in the comments below, and I will see you guys next time.